Thank you all for joining. Today is April 5th, 2020. We are going to study the book In the Greater World. And uh, I'll pass to Julio, who's going to conduct this meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we start, remember to uh, have your mics muted, okay, so that we don't have any uh, disturbances from the background. And uh, let us start with our prayer. As always, we ask in our prayers the assistance, the attention to each and every one of us from the spiritual benefactors who come now to each one of our homes, bringing to us serenity, love, peace. We ask that they bless this study, that they assist us in our understanding, in our discussion of the topics, especially of these topics, which, which is so important and so neglected at times. We ask continuously for strength and courage for all the endeavors, for all the efforts in our lives, so that we may progress morally and intellectually. We open our homes to all brothers and sisters here and from the spiritual realm who, like us, are in need of consolation and education. May they be guided to each and every one of our homes and partake of this, these blessings, of this great study that we have. And with this in our minds and in our hearts, we ask your permission, dear benefactors, to start our meeting today. Okay. Okay. So um, João is going is displaying now the uh, the text, and we are actually going to start one paragraph before. Okay. I want I want Soraya is going to read for us, and I want her to read one paragraph uh, uh, before the point of where we should uh, have picked up just so that we don't miss much. So we are going to start for most incarnates. And go ahead, Sorada, when you're ready. Okay, okay. For most incarnates, the juvenile phase of, this, of their philosophical forces undeniably represents a delicate period of sensations in light of the creative and preserving laws that rule the human family. This is incidental and does not define the substantial reality. The control center of sex is not located in the dense body, but in the sublime organization of the soul. Down on earth, men and women are distinguished according to specific organic features. As for us, in transit to higher spiritual regions, the remembrance of our earthly existence is still preponderant. We know, however, that in such higher regions, femininity and masculinity are characteristics of souls that are highly passive or openly active. Consequently, we know that in the variations of our experiences, we gradually acquire divine qualities such as determination and tenderness, strength and humility, power and gentleness, intelligence and sentiment initiative and intuition, wisdom and love, until we retain our supreme balance in God. Convinced of this universal reality, we cannot forget that any exteriorization of the sexual instinct on earth, in whichever way it may express itself, will not be destroyed but transmuted once a state of sublimation is achieved. The sexual expressions of the animals participate in the same ascending impulse. Amongst early peoples, sexual inclusion was expressed by absolute ownership. The fully active personality of the man dominated the completely passive personality of the woman. However, the patient work of millennium has transformed these relationships. Woman, man, 
woman, mother, and man, father, gave rise to a new breath of renewal to the spirit. Based on sexual experiences, the tribe became family. The hut metamorphosis into the home. Armed defense gave way to jurisprudence. The wild forest was transformed into peaceful farm. The heterogeneous character of huge expanses of territory opened the way to the communion of ideals in progressive homelands. Barbarism rose to civilization. The crude processes of physical attraction were sub- transubstantiated into artistic aspirations that dignify the individual and grunts, grunts were elevated to mel- memories, melodies. Stimulated by the creative power of sex, the human community is advancing, albeit slowly, toward the supreme goal of divine love. From the spontaneous, brutal manifestations of the less elevated senses, the soul is, trans- is traveling toward its glorious initiation. Despite ownership, affinity, foundness, devotion, selflessness, and sacrifice constitute aspects of this sublime journey. Thank you, Sarai. Sometimes, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. 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 So I'm just waiting for João to put it back to the beginning. Good. Mm-hmm. All right. So. Before we start, it's important that we understand one point in this text. This is actually, a lot of it is taken from the book Evolution in Two Worlds, where André Luis discusses how humanity has progressed from the uh, hominid and hominoid phase to what we call the human phase. The hominid and hominoid are pre-human forms. Just going to say it like that in a very simple way. We're not going to be debating the, the philosophical details or points about hominoid, hominid. We we'll just think of pre-human forms, pre-human stage. So with that in mind, what André Luis says in Evolution to Worlds is an account of the last 400,000 years of our existence here on earth. And this is what we are reading right now. So when we read these paragraphs, what Soraida has just read for us, let us understand that this description is not men and women of today in comparison to men and women of 100 years ago or 10 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. But we are, we're looking at something that is going to a million or, or 400,000 years ago compared to today. This is very important because otherwise, if we don't have this in our background, some sentences might sound very strange to us, to say the least. In the first paragraph, so I read where it starts for most incarnates, okay? The most important point of that paragraph is that when it says that the control of center for sex is not in the body. So sexual conduct, not the sexual act, the sexual act is physical, but sexual conduct, which manifests itself in many different ways, including, but not limited to the sexual act, Sexual conduct is actually part of the organization of the soul. And this is very important because it means that sexual, the sexual act as a consequence of the conduct is not something that is automatic, that we do and can have control over it and should have control over it. And in also that being a part of the organization of the soul, it's something that the soul can use to express itself and also to evolve from the, the consequences of that expression. When we go to the first paragraph of today's um, uh, uh, discussion, you know, the second, sorry, down on earth, men and women, 
So here is the part that we have to be very careful. This is why I was telling you about the 400,000 year span, because the idea here is that Andre Luis is equating femininity and masculinity, personality traits, be careful with these words, okay? Personality traits, he's equating with passiveness and activity. Femininity being passivity and masculinity being activity. And why is it that I'm saying that we should be very careful with this? It's not wrong, but if we just read without looking at the context, it may look like females are, and I'm gonna say females for now, okay? Because the idea is to relate to the physical body. So females would be passive in their behavior and males would be active. Well, that's how we started. As animals, as pre-humanoids in the hominid or the hominoid stage, that was exactly what was done. It was in that sense that we, it was in that, uh, that manner that we behave. And what, whatever we have, discuss, we have discovered in, by anthropology, by serious studies, show that females of our species, or even before we became homo, homo sapiens, there was more of a passive behavior and the males would be more of an active behavior. And this is what he's stating there, but he's not saying that this is how it should be always, that we are going to evolve and we're going to learn to have femininity and masculinity despite our gender identification. That this passiveness, when needed, it will be a trait that we will express and sometimes we also express a trait that is activity, open activity. And we are going to learn both of them and use more of one or the other as we evolve, depending on the context, depending on the circumstances. But when we started our journey in the human form or slightly pre-human form, we started with a very wide separation because there was not enough intelligence to weigh them and to give them the necessary weight in each circumstance. As we develop our intelligence, as we develop our free will, as we develop our expressions in the physical realm, be it in a male or a female body or form, we will learn both of them, the femininity as he calls here, and the masculinity, in a sense, the, a passiveness or an activity. And we will learn to operate them appropriately to each circumstance. Ron, can you lower this a little bit now to the next paragraph, please? So as, as we move on, he says that, you know, it, it, this is what he was saying, that we are learning both of these traits. He, that, he is actually making the, the many traits into two extremes, the femininity and the masculinity, just because it's easier for us. We, we like to have extremes. And once we learn extremes, it's easier for us then to start looking at the shades of gray that populate between the two extremes. So he is just saying determination and tenderness, strength and humility, power and gentleness. And, and so he is giving traits that usually are associated to one another by the extremes, being extremes. And he's saying that we will learn all of them because it's not possible to reach the, a balance with only one or the other. We must go for both of them and learn this balance in order to reach to God in our, you know, in our moral and in our intellectual progresses towards God, towards, you know, being perfect. We then have, so Jean, can you move it a little more? So here, on convinced of this universal reality, what we are looking is of the exteriorization. Like I said, 
the sexual conduct is in our essence. We as spirits, we have that sexual conduct in us. And that sexual conduct is actually an, uh, an atavism, an inheritance from all the experiences that we've had in our past reincarnation processes. It's there in us, it's part of us, of our essence. But this conduct is expressed here in the physicality here on earth through our sexual instinct initially. But when we say sexual instinct, we need to be very careful not to believe that there is an automatism. That's exactly what Andalus is trying to say to us, that it starts by its expression through the sexual instinct, but we are allowed to transmutate it by using our intelligence. And when it says he we can transmutate it to a state of sublimation, the sexual conduct, whenever it's manifested, whatever form it gets manifested, physically speaking, in the physicality, or I should say, through the physicality, through the physical body, is actually a, a form for us to progress, especially morally, and achieve as much of a sublimation as we can within that certain reincarnation process we find ourselves in, okay? But he says very clearly, it's the patient work of millennia. We don't see these things happening all of a sudden. It's not within, we are gradually adding these things. And then he gives an example that when we looked at the first females and the first males of our species, right? It's now completely different. We are going towards more of, of, uh, of this woman, mother, and man, father. We are moving away from that very dichotomous, very, uh, uh, very separated um, expressions. And each side is learning a little bit of the other side as we progress and see it gives us a, a lot of uh, things here we go from the defense so we go from tribe or you know tribe to family the concept of tribe moves to family we also go from just a small shack or hut or just just like a a, a tepee or something like that was just to protect us from the environment into a home into something that's a lot more organized what we are seeing in this massive paragraph that says, however, the patient work of millennia, what we are seeing here is Andrea Luis is giving to us the, um, the uh, very crudely, because of course we don't have enough time to just revisit the entire human history, but it's telling us many things that we have been transforming very slowly throughout these 400,000 years of our existence here as human beings so the tribe into family you know the hut into home armed defense into jurisprudence so the law before we actually act on our own and all of this ends up having an effect on us and we have an effect on each one of these processes as well because one reacts upon the other and in that sense our sexual conduct and its expressions here on the physicality, on the physical world, should also follow this pattern and should also be transmutated into more sublime forms of expression, into more advanced forms of expressions. Basically, we are leaving the brutal stage and we are going towards elevated stages. In the next paragraph, okay, it just gives us uh, a few things, uh, a few examples, desire, ownership, affinity, fondness, right? These are going to be polished. And we are going to see, for instance, that if we could take a time machine and go back to the beginning of our species as human, uh, human forms, we would see that the form of desire, the form of ownership, was the concepts then were completely different than the ones we have today. And we will see that they were a lot cruder, coarser, 
than they are today. And if we project ourselves into the future, we're going to see that our standards today will be very crude to what we are going to have in 10,000 years, 100,000 years, whatever it is. We are polishing our expressions in the physical realm. We are polishing our manifestations through the physicality, through the physical form. And in this particular case, we're discussing the sexual conduct, the sexual behavior. So the sexual conducts manifested in the physical realm are progressing as well. Okay. Soraya, can you read it for us? I think I think she muted herself. I don't know. I'm trying to. Hello. Hi. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes humans take years, centuries, and many lifetimes to go from one level to the next. Few individuals are able to keep themselves above the fair prayer with the equilibrium that is required. Required. Very few have crossed the territory of ownership without battling cruelly with the monsters of selfishness and journey to which they have completely surrendered. A small number travel the road of tenderness without shackling themselves for a long stretch of the many chains of exclusiveness. And sometimes only after millennium of excruciating, purifying trials can the soul reach the luminous zenith of sacrifice for its final deliverance in route to new cycles of unification with the divinity. The rapture of the saint was once a mere impulse, like the polished diamond, a drop of heaven chosen to reflect the divine light. The diamond lived on the riverbed, ignored amongst, amongst the unpolished pebbles. It is obvious that, just as the diamond is put to the polishing wheel in order to achieve its ultimate beauty, so it is with the sexual instinct. In order to be crowned with the glories of elation, it must submit itself to the imper imper imperatives of responsibility, the diamonds of discipline and the requirements of selflessness. Thank you. These okay. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. All right. So the main point here is, as we were discussing before, we are in a process in a, in, a, in a process of uh, improving ourselves. So again, I remind everyone of this very long period of time. And then here in this part where the, uh, the lecturer in the, physical, in the spiritual realm, because this is a lecture in the spiritual realm, if you remember correctly, from the beginning of this yeah. chapter, right? And there Luis and Brother Calderaro are attending a lecture. And these paragraphs we are reading are the speech of the lecturer. So the lecture is saying here to us that all of this is not happening overnight and that we go and uh, we go from one stage to another, sometimes with a lot of difficulties and it takes us a lot of time. So he gives us a few examples, the ownership. So when, for instance, uh, in a couple, one, uh, one has this, um, it's a site, not necessarily, here we're not talking about slavery in the sense of, physical ownership. It's like psychological ownership. When one person is so possessive that selfishness and jealousy ends up taking the most out of the relationship and actually just sometimes even destroying that relationship. A lot of us struggle with that in our misguided expressions towards love. Okay, We end up showing selfishness and jealousy we may believe that it's a form of love. And that's why I said it's a misguided representation or expression of love. Because true love cannot be jealous. True love cannot be selfish. So some of us struggle for reincarnations, many, many reincarnations with the concept of, you know, territorial uh, ownership or psychological ownership. 
Because when we, we believe that we love someone, what we are actually doing is uh, owning that individual, believing that we do own that person. Others is not with the ownership, but with, with respect to tenderness. So they see, for instance, in the expression of their sexual conduct, only a form of power, a, a, form, a form of um, uh, certifying themselves of their dominance. And they are incapable of achieving tenderness. So all of these things are traits, are manifestations of our of our of our uh, mind, uh, manifestations of our essence, of our spirit, that in the physical realm end up producing negative consequences, a destructive approach. As we move from that instinctive sexual conduct towards something that is more sublime, we polish these things. And then he gives us the idea of the saint. Um, this is an allegory, of course, it's, um, it, it's just for us to understand of, of those who have of those who have reached this sublimation of the impulses and have created out of those impulses beautiful emotions. Saint here is not the idea of celibacy. It's the idea of the one who uses the sexual conduct to express in the physical realm the most beautiful actions. So then the sexual act in this case is one that is filled with love as opposed to lust, for instance. So read saint here, not a celibate, but the idea of those who have reached that balance that we saw in the previous paragraph, right? Uh, two or three paragraphs before, that it's the balance that we must reach in order to express ourselves in the most constructive way. Uh, Julio yeah. Alini has a question. Sure. Hi, everyone. Of course, I do. I have a lot of questions, um, but I'm going to try to be <clears throat> to ask just the main one. Um, since it's it seems to me like these days, like you know, the last maybe 10 years with the explosion of um, dating apps and a lot of, I, I read a, a statistic that says that uh, large cities have three women per man um, that are educated, college educated. So uh, a lot more women than men in larger cities, uh, dating apps. It feels to me like we're kind of separating the evolution between men and women, it seems to me, and I, I don't mean to be prejudiced, it's just a, a observation. With the, with the single, single uh, community in the dating apps, the women are very, you know, um, introspective and, and, and they're, they're more toward like being um, conscious of the sexual conduct and men are not. Um, so I have two questions. My first question is, would it be um, something to observe that maybe people who are incarnating as females as opposed to males uh, are becoming more evolved because they're more, um, in, I, I don't, again, I don't mean to be prejudiced, like, you know, statistically and the way that we have been observing it, the men are, are kind of like, coming backwards a little bit in the sexual conduct and women are not. Um, that's my first question. And the second question is, how come we don't have anything more um, current from the spirits? Do we get in, do you know of anything that the spirits might have said that fit our days? Okay. Um. The first thing is we don't regress. So this is important. Uh, I know what you meant. Um, uh, 
we do not regress. So let us just say that the worst that can happen is that we will be evolving very, 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 very slowly, that we might be even imperceptible from one reincarnation to another. So that's always important for us to reemphasize every single time. Um, the other thing is, as you pointed out, I don't think we can use this particular example because you you said very well that this particular statistics was for a specific specific subset or even of the female population so it is very hard to get one sampling that is already biased and use that to understand the population it's one of the biggest problems in statistics with the statistics we can actually create any numbers we want and by that, I don't mean necessarily to um, be dishonest. It's just that if we miss sample, if we sample just one part that is not representative of the whole, everything that we obtain as results cannot be applicable, are not, it's, uh, all the results are not applicable to the whole. There is another, re another thing we need to understand is that the, association to a female or a male body and even ident a gender identification, let's put it this way, uh, switch, not from one reincarnation to the other, we don't go like that, but we do. So perhaps one individual here, and I'm gonna say individual because I don't want to, like you said very well, I don't want to be pressured either. If one individual, for instance, today shows a great deal of disrespect, for instance, to the opposite gender, okay? Um, this individual may have been that gender before, just in the previous reincarnation, this is the first switch. And because it's the first switch, simply doesn't know how to behave properly. But it's part of the progress, it's part of the education of that spirit. I believe that we are always evolving. To, be, to think that where one side is regressing or the one side is just staying put while the other one is very dangerous because it end up, ends up inciting even more discrimination. And we should think that this is not the case because what we learn from the spirits that we are all evolving. And if in that evolution, we had to be one only and not the other, then there would be already a bias from the spiritual realm, which is difficult for us to wrap our heads around. I mean, if that is the case, then pretty much everything we study, everything that we have ends up being conflictive and conflicting. Which comes to the second question that you had, Aline. Um, I, we, we do have other publications that are just a little more recent than this one, but we're not talking about something that is just five years ago or two years ago. But a lot of what we have here, we're still struggling with, a, struggling with a lot of what we see here already and still. So we even don't need anything that is more, uh, uh, more, uh, more recent because we still don't understand even the very basic of it. When it comes to respect from one gender to the opposite, or respect even for, for the no gender identification or the, the a gender identification that may not correspond to the physicality, all of these things end up going back to the idea of respect. And we don't need to know or be told what respect is. We all know because we all expect from others so it's a question of how much pride and how much prejudice we want to polish off from our own spirits in order to learn to respect others whatever their identification is or even their physicality is so it's not going to be the text and updated texts that are going to to do anything and there is going to be a paragraph here where the, the lecture is going to say, our idea is not to impose restrictions or give re regulations and rules, but actually 
to embrace humanity as much as they allow us and assist them in their evolution, in their progress, so they won't fall as many times. You will see it's going to be more towards the end of the chapter. And I find that very nice because it tells us that there's no amount of, of, of information, whether orally given or, or written, that is going to change us if we do not want to change ourselves. May I say something? Uh, please do. I have a question. Is this your opinion or is this what it is really written in terms of what the spirit really said? Uh, the reason is because what you stated seems to me your opinion on the first part of Alini questions, which is related to how women are evolving in terms of rights, in terms of what is correct or not correct in regard to sexuality. We see many research coming from several countries, including India, Russia, uh, just to name a few, in which women are more and more voicing how they should be treated and how men are still behind, they are lagging behind. These are not my opinions, these are statistics. So to me, Julio, I think you, I perceived what you said on the first part as your opinion, because it does not match with the current studies. So my, I admire and appreciate that you are trying to explain that part to us. I really respect and I welcome that. But I feel concerned about what is opinion and what is really the study. Your interpretation might be different from what is really written there. Sometimes can be exactly what you, it is written there. So I feel concerned about those messages. Uh, um, can, I, can I say something here, Julio? Yes. Um, Maria, um, we, we have to be very careful. Julio said in the very beginning, we are talking uh, here in the evolution of 400,000 years. Uh, and that's what we are studying here in terms of sexual behavior and sexual activity. When you try to, to bring that to a five-year period or a 10-year period or the present or even with a hundred-year period, uh, it, it, it moves away from uh, what the text is trying to bring to us. Uh, the evolution that uh, we have, and, I, um, and, and it's very important here in our studies to understand that what we try to bring is not our personal opinion, is the is what spirit brings to us, what spiritism brings to us. Because my opinion, Julio's opinion, uh, your opinion, it's, it's, it's just opinions. And we, we can stay the whole time here talking about opinions, but uh, the reality is what the spirits are trying to tell us is what we should try to interpret. And I think that uh, uh, this, uh, this text, this chapter, is a chapter that can be studied in 200 years time and it will be as, as actual as it is today because it talks about our evolution as human beings, not our evolution presently. Of course, we are in perfect spirits and there is so much going on that is uh, not appropriate and that is clearly wrong in terms of abuse, in terms of discrimination, and even in terms of uh, oppression that uh, against women that still exists in many countries. But, um, but the idea here is, is really not to, to go down to the, to the details of what we are going through in the present days in the sense of uh, applying to the text, because the text is much more of a vision of us of our evolution from uh, spiritual principle to perfect spirits. So how we go through this uh, journey, uh, going from one side to the other, the male and the female uh, evolution, because they, are, they have different characteristics. And as Julio said in the very beginning, 
um, in the beginning, we are in the extremes. But towards the end, when we become a perfect spirit, we have no gender. We are not male, we're not female, we are perfect spirit. So to reach there, you imagine going from the bottom of a pyramid to the top of a pyramid. In the beginning, it's very extreme, and in the end, is only one. So we, we need to keep uh, ourselves, our minds here, understanding that we are talking about the evolution of the human being and not the evolution of ourselves in the last uh, 50 years, which is, a, we evolved a lot in the last 50 years, in the last 20 years. Since the Me Too movement three years ago, we, have, we are evolving all the time. And I think both, um, both sides are learning a lot. Maybe one side is learning faster than the other, but we cannot say this now. We can look back uh, 50 years from now and, and then we can say, wow, at that time, this and that was happening. Like uh, trying to understand why this pandemic is happening as it's happening. We cannot analyze that. We have to go through it and we have to go into the future and then look back to try the, to understand the reasons. So it's, uh, it's, it's really complicated to discuss what we're going through um, in terms of sexual revolution and all these things. Um, without having the ample view of our evolution as, a, as, a, as human beings, back to you, Julie. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to add. I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's not my opinion. And like you said, and what this is was, what I was going to say, that we have to see it from a very, very large span of time and just look at progress. We are progressing and that's the most important thing for all of us to take that we are moving forward, that's all. Uh, just to, to, to one more thing that I think applies to what you both just said. Um, maybe, Maria, what's happening is information is now being disseminated. This all existed, but now we're seeing it's all out in the open, right? So, uh, Joan was right, the Me Too movement really made people think, and we do have a lot of women that are also uh, biased and uh, sexist. Is that the word? Yeah. Yes. Um, so we, we, we have to think about that one. And there's another one that I wanted to say. Maybe this text is giving us a hint, because we're all here because we're worried about our evolution, our progression, right? Most people are not reading, the, unfortunately, the spiritist uh, doctrine like we are. So um, maybe this text is just giving us a hint as to what it means to be evolving. An idea. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. No, thank you. I, I understood. My concern is that the text also does not, at least has references to how and why women were perceived as passive and one of the main reasons from the 1300s, 1200s, uh, 1500s, 1600s, 1800s, women were suppressed. They were perceived as weak and that they should submit. They were not allowed to ownership of land. They were not allowed to choose their spouse. So those things uh, are missing in at least in that specific text. There is a spirit who establishes that. But and then what was the experience of that disincarnated, that spirit? I'm not a question, I'm just trying to comprehend what is historic, his, uh, historically, you know, it is knowledge, anthropological uh, research. That's what I'm trying to comprehend in that context, because that context is just saying one part of the story, but not what was the reason why women were perceived that way. Uh, okay, um, I I believe that the 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 text uh, the text is is talking about our evolution as human beings, and not about oppression that is an injustice against you women that has been committed throughout the centuries and is still being committed today. Um, women didn't have a soul according to the, to the Catholic Church until the mid of the 19th century. So um, 
we are evolving and uh, that's the most uh, spiritism if you study spiritism and you really are a spiritist you have to understand the concept that we are always evolving that we never regress a, this is one of the basic tenets of spiritism so the fact that we are evolving doesn't mean we are perfect otherwise we wouldn't be here we are far from perfect but uh, we are evolving and that's one of the basic tenets of spiritism even if we don't see if we look at someone and 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 as how is this individual evolving well he or she is evolving so but we are all at different levels of evolution of course all of us here in perfect spirits and uh, and we have a lot of a lot to learn and that's why we are trying to study here uh lillian you have a question go ahead um if if we look at this text we're talking about the pyramid right you go from total inequality of genders and extremes to the point of the pyramid where gender disappears this is one and then the other one we were talking about a relationship based on ownership um and uh very primitive to a relationship that is sublime and based on love only it's just pure love how does marriage evolve in that pyramid because if you if you evolve from a point of ownership to you're not you you're no longer attached to the shackles of exclusivity number one and second genders start to be more fluid how how does marriage evolve in that story because marriage is something it's such an institution in the biblical times for example and there's so many rules about marriage and about you know adultery and about you know it's 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 always been a one-on-one -on -one situation a man and a woman together historically so how how does that model evolve in that pyramid well marriage is going to evolve pretty much in the same way as the uh, sentiment of ownership that will develop into universal love it will start at the base being a uh, a form of uh, ownership a form of a contractual form actually uh, traditionally you have in some cultures women purchasing men purchasing the husband and uh, husband husbands purchasing their women uh, um, so we are going to have that at the very beginning and then we're going to start going towards a situation where there is not going to be a need for a contract we will live together with someone and the amount of respect will be the contract so the contract will move from a physical thing a piece of paper for instance or or a symbol of authority from a city or from a community saying the two of you are bound together to something where only respect is going to be between two individuals but what is beyond that i think is difficult for us and then it would be my opinion in that case and uh, but what we see from the text that we read in spiritism is they are the spirits are always telling us they are not against the co the physical contract but they're just saying that the physical contract is really meaningless if two individuals together do not have respect for one another. Spiritism always focuses on that respect, which leads me to believe that eventually that is what our evolution will reach. But beyond that, I cannot fathom at the moment. Yeah, I think it's, um, um, it's a union of uh, two individuals with, uh, with the same ideals, with the same... Uh, share of of uh of love care and interest independent of uh and again the spirits have no gender so as we evolve we are going to be more and more together by our share of uh, common interests share of love and respect for one another independently of who we are so nowadays you see all these um conflicts uh, arising from 
relationships that if you really um, remove yourself from the middle of it and you analyze outside, again, it's evolution. We are uh, experimenting and making mistakes with different forms of uh, relationship that uh, will help us grow, will help us learn to respect, will help us learn to, to understand the other's point of view. Um, but again, in an imperfect society, everything is imperfect, right? The, the, the marriages are imperfect. Uh, and we only learn as we evolve now uh, again, it's much better today than it was 200, 300, 500, 1,000 years ago. Uh, but it is far, far from perfect. It's just a better version of what we, of the bad we had. You know, it's the like they say, it's uh, it's the worst possible situation. But there's nothing better that we have found yet. <laughs> Go. May I? Yes, Luis, yes. Uh, this, this question about marriage uh, uh, reminds me of the question 696 of the book of the spirits. Uh, where the spirits tell Kardec that uh, uh, marriage establishes a fraternal solidarity between human beings. And when she referred to marriage, uh, I don't think it has to do with a contract, but with that fraternal solidarity between human beings. So, and, and this is what has been evolving a long time. My personal view, interpreting the, the, the Book of Spirits. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks. Um, uh, hand, Soraida, yeah. Okay. These conclusions, however, should not lead us to plans for compulsory sanctification in the corporeal world. No human being would deny his or her stage of evolution. We cannot expect an uneducated primitive to wear the academy gown of a university professor and overnight begin to teach Roman law. Consequently, it would be foolish to expect the behavior of a saint from a person of average evolution. Nature, the representation of inexhaustible goodness, is a benign mother who offers work and assistance to all the offspring of creation. Her determination to sustain us is as strong as our determination to progress in the direction of the supreme good. Therefore, we do not want to profess strict standards of artificial virtue in the world, nor favor any system of unconscious relationships. Above all, our banner is that of fraternal understanding. Let us work so that the light of understanding may be established among our incarnate fellow spirits so that their love-related troubles do not lead, a, lead so many victims to the blink of death intoxicated by criminal passion. Due to a lack of sexual understanding, countless crimes abound on the earth, mm -hmm. causing strange and dangerous processes of, in processes of insanity far and wide. From time to time, one or more victims enter a hospital for the mentally afflicted and submit themselves to medical treatment, much like workers who bring their broken tools to a repair shop. However, in these places, we find only those who, embittered and defeated, have hit rock bottom. Millions of our brothers and sisters are in a state of semi-madness, right in their own homes or in institutions. They fill the ranks of those incapable of commitment or selflessness, immersing themselves little by little in the dark swampland of hallucination. With their crazed minds, fixed in the dent of subconscious, they become lost in the base automatisms and, and stubbornly hold on to their depressing psychic condition, jealousy, dissatisfaction, misunderstanding, 
thoughtlessness and failure to restrain their sexual appetites spread terrible phenomena of instability. Thank you, Sarai. Okay. Okay. So in this particular part of the speech, remember this is a lecture, right? The benefactor is telling us that we cannot deny our human nature, which actually is our spiritual nature, I should say. We cannot deny our nature because we are what we are at this moment. There is no way for us to grow by leaps and bounds, to progress by leaps and bounds. And with this in mind, we should, what we should do is understand the point we are at this moment and then work with whatever we have. Work in the sense of our sexual conduct, in the sense of how we manifest that sexual conduct in the physicality. And in, that, in this sense, that's when he says, and quite beautifully, at least to me, when he says that they do not want to create standards of artificial virtue in this world. They do not want to favor this or that. What they want to do is fraternal understanding. The spiritual realm wants to assist us so that everything that we do in terms of manifesting, expressing our sexual conduct in the physicality, as we do so, we do it in the best way possible, taking into consideration the amount of progress we have already made up to that point, so that the experience that we create and go through here in the physicality ends up being constructive. Again, very important to understand that constructive here is not with the idea of the um, sanctihood, uh, uh, sanctity, is with the idea of what we are capable of grasping at this moment, what we are capable of understanding and learning at this moment. And then he, con he continues by saying that most of us here in the physical plane, right, uh, are still bound to a, a form of behavior that is very automated. And because of that, it creates countless crimes here on earth. And then it starts talking about, but let us try to understand. So this is actually, now I'm going to go all the way to the end when it says that we are shackled to a subconscious level of our minds. Remember always that we divide the mind into three stages, right? Conscious, the subconscious, the unconscious, but it's only one mind. We divide it in like, like that because it, is a, it allows us to break something that is very complex, something we do not yet understand completely into smaller problems. And by tackling the smaller problems, perhaps we'll be able to understand the whole in an easier way. So the subconscious being that which we bring to us, with us here to the physical realm, the subconscious being that part of the mind that we are not using on a regular basis. It's there all the time, but it's more, it, it, it requires a little, it's, it's under lock and key. Whereas the conscious is the one that is completely exposed. So when we go through life, now here in general, we have experiences. We create these opportunities, we create these experiences, and then we live through them. We live them and through them. And we can, as we are going through any process here, not just sexual conduct, but as we are going through any process, we have an immediate interaction with all the, the input all the information that is flooding us at that moment through that experience. That is our conscious mind that allows us to smell, for instance, the senses, to smell, to see, to hear, to taste, to touch, the feeling of touch and pressure and things like that, or temperature. But then there is something that is a little bit hidden from that, which is the subconscious mind which is also receiving all this input, all this information, and is working with what we have from previous reincarnations 
And as it tries to manifest that, may not manifest it in a direct form, but perhaps what we would call more of an instinctive form. So when we allow ourselves not to experience things in a more rational way, in a more interactive way, but we do it autom automatically in an automated form, we are basically acting, as we would say here, instinctively. And because of that, this instinct is what we, come, we have as an atavism. Remember, atavism is our inheritance from previous reincarnations. But what is the, why is it so important to be careful with atavisms? Well, very simple. We say here that we always progress that we are always going forward, never, we, we never go backwards. Well, then by that, we can conclude that any previous reincarnation that I have had, anyone I pick, I was worse than I am today. It just comes from the very definition or, or the belief that we have that we are always progressing. Even if it's a minute amount that it's almost imperceptible to me, I'm always a little better, whatever that little is, than I was, than I used to be. So anything that is atavic, anything that is an inheritance, is by definition less, I won't say bad, but less than I have now. So if now I operate only based on that instinctive Form on that with that at at atavic processes, I'm actually always operating at a much lower uh, efficiency, or be the better word would be at a much lower uh, with much uh, lower capabilities of understanding the information that I collect from the surroundings. Okay, so if I now experience something instead of being instinctive about it instead of being using the subconscious, what I should do is attempt to interact more with that. When I do react instinctively, I don't act, like I said, I react. And this is why, this is what this uh, mentor is saying. This is why we have, one of the reasons why we have so many crimes, when it's related to sexual conduct. Because in that atavic inheritance, in that atavism, we bring the, the, the memories of pastimes when we behave differently that we should behave today. And in doing so, we are incongruent. We are not behaving as society now would expect us to behave collectively. Because we have to understand that in, when it comes to sexual conduct, it is also a form of a social interaction. So uh, if, if I'm now using as my guidance, my internal guidance, things that used to be, things that were from past reincarnation processes, they are not going to fit as well today in this one. So I am operating in an automated mode and in doing so, I am not capable of immersing myself in all the experiences of the moment and the form that I actually respond to them is much more through reaction than action. And then he says that a lot of us go through these uh, issues and then very few end up submitting themselves to some form of treatment, to some form of uh, attention by others. That's when he was saying that we go into, uh, we basically commit ourselves to a certain institution or to a certain treatment. That most of us are actually going unscathed. Those who actually look for, for assistance end up being so at the bottom of the, uh, of the pit so they have hit rock bottom, as it says in the text, that is now a lot more difficult to deal with the situation that they have created for himself or herself than if had, they had started this process of a guidance, of assistance much earlier on. 
it's still good because the person has reached a point where the amount of suffering has guided that individual to look for assistance. It's excruciating, it's painful, but at least the person has admitted to himself or to herself that he or she needs assistance, needs guidance. But a lot of us actually don't do that. And we continue on in this subconscious exercise in this atavic processes and we simply miss opportunities for growth both morally and intellectually alini has a question again uh, go ahead alini uh, it's not really a question i just well maybe it's kind of a question uh would you agree that in this sense uh, Joana de Angelis actually brought us a uh, more uh, elabor elaborate and updated information as to how we get out of our quote unquote automated state and more and, and work more through our emotions. Um, yes, but I, I want to say one thing. Um, uh, I like the fact that you mentioned Joanna Judges, um, and I, what I want to say is actually for all of us, Joanna Judges is very difficult to read, and I understand it. A lot of people say that to me, but I want everybody to understand why is it so difficult. It's because Joanna Judges, she is adding another floor to the building. You see, we had. We had Emmanuel, we had Andrea Luis, they had the first stories of, of this building. And now Joana Giage is putting the, the upper stories of, of this building, the upper floors. So one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because she already starts from a point where we should have already understood the certain basics of it. And Joana Giage then is bringing not necessarily updated information, but she's now being more detailed where Andre Luis was more prosaic and Emmanuel was more, perhaps the word would be elusive because we read one then we read the other, then we read the next one. Yes. And each one brings newer and newer information, more and more details. Yes. Um, yes, I totally agree with you with everything that you said before you do was excellent. And I know that you have more to say about it, but just because Juana de Angelis was uh, brought up, I totally agree with you. But before you continue your explanation of hers um, work, um, I, I just say that I always found the Emmanuel and Andrea Luis very much close to the Brazilian mentality and the situations, of course, and the names, the culture. And that furnished a lot of how we picked up on the uh, soap operas that we end up enjoying so much when everybody here grow, growing up remembers very well. It is a tremendous part of our culture. And, and I think that Joana de Angelis is giving a little bit of the intellectual side of spiritism to be explained to um, now, it feels like, to be explained to the English-speaking <coughs> world. Because in my mind, from everything that I've been reading in, um, of Alan Kardec's work, dealt into Emmanuel or Andre Luis or <coughs> Joana de Angelis, it feels like it is coming into um, a point where the, um, what is out there in English is, is enough to um, convey the entirety, the entirety of this, of what Spiritism is. I don't know if you get what I, mm -hmm. um, I said. That's all. She has a more scientific style. She has a more referential style as opposed to Andre Luis, who is prosaic, and Emmanuel, who uh, has more of a historical style. These are styles, yes. but the styles end up influencing the subject that they treat 
Of course. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Aline. I don't have any any more comments on this part. So, if we have no comment, uh, no questions, uh, we can continue reading. Okay. Disturbing mental images are being projected on the earth, compelling us to perform a strenuous work of assistance so as to limit the circle of misfortune and horror of those who carelessly fling themselves into rec reckless adventures of animalized sentiment. We will not solve such a complex problem by merely using medical interventions, although the contribution of medical science is admirable in treating effects. It does not address inner causes. Personality is not the work of the in internal labor of the glands, but the product of the chemistry of the mind. Thank you, sir. Dr. Okay. Okay. So here, what we see is as we misbehave, what does misbehavior in this case entails? is when we have one information and as we apply it, as we manifest it in the physical realm, we do it in some way that is destructive to us, destructive or non-constructive if you prefer, in the sense that it brings us more difficulties, it creates more issues, more problems for us. So, when we do this, and here we're talking about specifically with sexual conduct, let us remind ourselves of that, we associate ourselves by the lowering of our vibrations to lower vibrations from the spiritual realm as well. But then an interesting point comes to mind. Animals do not exercise as much intelligence as we do. I won't say they don't have any intelligence because it's not really like that. Everything in the, in the evolutionary scale is a continuum, okay? But let us make a, a little bit of a division, a very abrupt division, just for the sake of our discussion here. And animals not being capable of exercising as much intelligence as we humans do, they act on an, an, on an instinctive level. So why aren't animals responsible for these mental, disturbing mental images on earth? Because in manifesting that instinctive behavior, they do not have the intelligence to exercise an evaluation of their actions. There, it comes to them naturally. This is not the case for us. As we have evolved from that proto-human form to the human form, we have acquired notions of the sublime, of the artistic. We have acquired, and we are still polishing these notions, as well as the notion of good, of goodness, actually not good, goodness, of uh, justice. And when we act instinctively, then we act against this notion that we have developed collectively as a commu and community. We work against these notions of, the, of beauty, of universal love, of charity, of goodness. It's this dichotomy, it is this difference between our behavior and what our intelligence is already giving us collectively as guidance that produces the lower vibrations. The animals themselves do not have that lower vibration because they are not exercising as much intelligence to evaluate their actions. That is how they act and that's how they know how to act. They don't know better. We do. If we do not know it by, for ourselves and by ourselves, we know from the collective. We know from the community because some actions are san sanctioned and some actor, uh, actions are not. Some actions are censored and some actions are not. It is this discrepancy between what we want to do 
from what we should be doing that creates the lower vibrations that allows that allow us to enter into communication with the lower vibrations of the spiritual realm which creates an immense amount of work he says here strenuous work for us for the assistance from the benefactors for the benefactors in the spiritual realm and they have to act they have to help us they have to well they don't have they help us they guide us towards this problem and i think one of the most important thing is the very last sentence that sorida read to us personality is not the work of the internal labor of the glands but the product of the chemistry of the mind this is a reinstatement of what we read in the first paragraph today what is saying here is the following that we as we behave our conduct our sexual conduct as it manifests itself in the physicality it is not manifesting because of our hormonal glands our behavior our manifestation our expression in the physicality when it comes to the sexual conduct is actually a product of the mind it's there in the spirit in the essence when the spirit is perturbed when the spirit is ignorant when the spirit is too proud proud when the spirit is too possessive all of that will be expressed manifest transferred to the physicality which will then manifest express it in the physical realm but the cause is there in the spiritual realm in other words i cannot do something that becomes censored by society and try to excuse myself by saying oh i was built this way it's my physical body my glands are pushing me to do it no so we we should not see this as a um, slap in the, uh, in the face what we should see this paragraph is from a constructive point of view from the point of view that i can say to myself hey you have within you the power to change this behavior all you need is to will it to want to do it that's all because if it had been something that was based on a physicality like my glands i wouldn't be able to change it but this type of misconduct this type of incoherent incoherence between what my spirit wills and what i end up doing in the end you know the famous you know do what i say but not do don't do what i do right if i have this type of behavior it means that i am responsible for it not my physical body not my physicality again we're talking about sexual conduct sexual uh, behavior expressed in the physicality okay I have a Did question. You... Oh, sorry. Um, is would this be then our moral part of, um, in respect of the misconduct? Well, I would say a yes with caution, uh, and the reason is I'm going to give you a very silly example, but it's true. Uh, when we say moral. Uh, uh, it, we have to be very careful because we have different ways of approaching that word. We should still use it. I'm not against it, but we should just be very, very careful that we are all speaking the same language and at, at, at addressing the word with the same meaning. For instance, in England, Victorian England, if a woman showed her elbow or her knees, she was considered a, a, woman, a woman of ill repute. And that was the moral. It was immoral. It was amoral or immoral, depending on how you want to approach the situation. So here I would say this: this would be our, uh, uh, this would be the part where they are trying to say what is the most constructive behavior for us, so that I don't get into the moral word and I don't get into the discussion of what moral is. Let's say what is constructive for us. What can I learn that is going to give to me a, a, a bountiful experience and an experience that will make me grow, that will make me 
improve myself. And I think that's what you meant, yes. Yeah, uh, Julia, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. go ahead. Um, <clears throat> just uh, for some ground rules for me, <laughs> if you can use them. Because, uh, you know, uh, I like when Elmo explained to us, uh, he tries to bring us um, how can we apply in our everyday life. For example, uh, when he talks about forgiveness, he understand that um, sometimes it's hard for us to forgive someone. But uh, he also says that at this level, us as a spiritist, we should be able not to uh, not to kill, not to, you know, get back to the person or revenge or send, uh, you know, uh, bad energies. Not necessarily forgive, but at this level, we should be able to do those things. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, this uh, sexual conduct, um, we have, you know, all this, you know, on, owning and the, the identity and all the subjects related to the sexual conduct. So uh, I don't know if there is a text on that, or maybe you can, you know, give your opinion. You know, I'll take your opinion. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, at this level, us as a spiritist, uh, what, 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 you know, should is a strong word, but for the lack of the better word, what should we be doing in terms of the uh, using this energy of our sexual conduct nowadays? Um, like I always say, it, it may sound jokingly, but it's the truth. We should, first of all, take the, our brains from neutral. In other words, not act through our subconscious, but interact, be present in the experiences of life. Because when we are present in our experiences, we can evaluate them on the fly, as the British say, by the seat of our pants, on the fly. And we are going to make mistakes. We are going to deviate. But the difference is that as we deviate and we, are, we analyze our actions right away, we can, re we can correct our course. The problem is not a mistake. We are going to err, we are going to commit fallacies, but it's not to commit them over and over and over again. When we act subconsciously, instinctively, in a way, which here is almost like being used as a synonym, when we act like that, we end up per perpetuating the mistakes that we make. So the idea is not of criticism, the idea is not, oh, I am perfect, I never make a mistake. No, but as we are present in our situations in life, in our experiences, we are allowed, we allow ourselves to correct, to correct ourselves, to correct our mistakes. And this is important, okay? So this, I, I would say, this would be one of them. And the other one is always, to uh, enlighten oneself, to study. Because there is only so much we can do on our own in terms of evaluating situations. We can only evaluate based on the knowledge that we have. In order to evaluate more and more, to be more and more critical of ourselves, we need to also understand more and more. So studying is also the other thing. Yeah, if I could add here Renato um, the if we apply to our relationships which in the end is what we we want to do is um, it goes back to the the, the basics of uh, what Jesus teaches us right do to others what we would like others to do unto you so if we have that in mind and apply that in our relationships uh, we can minimize the mistakes as much as possible 
uh, or minimize the effects of the mistakes because we are all learning and we are all evolving. But um, in terms of understanding and accepting our limitations is also a very important tool that we have to use it because we, we nowadays we fall very much into the blame game, either blaming others or blaming ourselves. And we don't move out of this uh, sentiments and we need to move on from it. So understanding, trying to minimize the mistakes, understanding the mistakes we make and moving on from it, forgiving ourselves, forgiving others and learning from it. Because when we make a mistake and we st start feeling guilty and we don't move from that, then we can cause a lot of harm to ourselves or to others. So to move always, move forward always, learning and uh, understanding, trying to learn to understand. Like Julio said, putting our brains to work, right? Putting our minds, our spirits, spiritual minds to work. Um, I think uh, Aline raised her hand again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and this is why I brought up uh, Joana de Angelis. And I, I have to say the reason why I can't read her is because her words are very, like she, she writes very, you know what I'm saying, right, Julio? It's very difficult to read her writing, her grammar. Um, I'm going to try to find it in Portuguese. I think it might be just my brain works better in my native language. I don't know. But the reason why is that I feel like we keep saying, get out of your instincts, you know, stop. At, we want to learn to stop acting at our uh, inferior tendencies. But these are, these are patterns that our brain has from our formative years, uh, some, something that happened in our childhood, maybe fear-based. And, and I think that the tools that we need are like more, it's, 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 it's more involved than just thinking, learn from our mistakes. That's a great point, but how do you actually make this happen? Right. It, it, it's, it's very um, broad to say we study, we learn, but it's some many times what's here doesn't fall into practice because we, we, we still, we're still, we still have our patterns, our psychological patterns. I think Julio can explain this better than me. Okay. Well, uh, good point, Aline. Uh, uh, what I would say is this, and this is not going to, this is going to be a general comment that is not just for this book. It's for all books in spiritism. I do this as well, so don't feel that I'm judging anyone here when I say this. We have a very bad habit. The moment that we take that book from the shelf or we open our electronic device to read it, we normally have a question in our minds. If we don't have the question that forced us to open the book, it comes to us during some discussion or lecture. But what we have to understand is that the books in Spiritism, they are no manuals, they are no guides. You see, if it's a manual, you, you buy a camera and you don't know how to do certain thing, you open the manual and the manual will say, click here, do this, push that, move the other thing and so on and so forth. In Spiritism, the books are built, they are, they are written to give us awareness of certain things because the solution or the answer to the problem that or the question that we have is going to be very very peculiar to each one of us very peculiar so it is basically in creating awareness um, when it comes to Joana de Angelis that awareness is now at a such detailed form that she is required to use a much more intricate and a much more formal form of writing. And it is difficult, it, it, or perhaps it's not difficult, but like Fabio was saying that it, it, she is more 
contemporaneous. Mm -hmm. But perhaps what, what we should say is that the, uh, some of us may be more used to formal writing because of our jobs than others, uh, or just a question of preference. But the thing is, always see these books as, as um, not as a manual, or, but more as a place where, oh, I need to focus on this. Now, to address the uh, one important point that you brought, brought up, which was the, that some of these patterns, these traits are part of all our growing up, our maturation process, as Ronald Giorgi uses it. Uh, that's true. And this is why it's very difficult for any one of these books to give us a solution because each and every one of us is unique in our growth, in our maturation processes. So it, it would be impossible. We would have, the book would never be, would never have an end. I agree with Julio. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. This is Fabio again. Um, because I am very used to reading history and philosophy books and memoirs and all in English and French. So I create, I, maybe my mind is set up to really understand her. I feel like she is not difficult at all. Uh, I tried to read her in Portuguese and I found that her to be more difficult in Portuguese than in English. Um, and I don't know how that is possible, but that's only my opinion. Um, and I would love to discuss her work with anyone who's interested because, um, again, she is talking about issues that Simone de Beauvoir were talking about in an intellectual world. And then, you know, and then you st if you see, you look at the work at Emmanuel Chu and um, Andrea Luis to a certain extent, it, it emulates a lot of what Emmanuel Kant was doing at the same time in a philosophical world, you know, in relation to God and what is the reason of being here. So this concept of having the acceptance of a soul in the intellectual world was already happening. But, um, and uh, spiritism, brilliantly tackles this by bringing Christian, throwing Christianity or the idea of Jesus Christ and the idea of love to kind of answer that question that these people have been questioning about. Because even before um, Kardec's work was uh, started, you know, there's a uh, guy in Sweden called Svetenborg, if I'm not mistaken, who also had the same, it's very similar to uh, Kardec's work. And it's, uh, you know, it's also related to other ramifications of other little sects here and there that were um, trying to give a response to the spirit as being the use of being all related to goodness or all related to good. And the, of course, for the whole of the Western civilization, the closest example that we have of that is Jesus Christ. And you know, the whole thing ties in together very nicely if you ask me. And it's just like the beginning. I think what we're going through, it might be bringing up, uh, hopefully, because you know, it's a constructive idea. It's the evolution and the progress that we have been reading about for, I don't know, 100 and more than almost 200 years about it now. So um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, OK, guys, we reached the end of it. Uh, time flies, but it's 12.33, so um, we need to stop here. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, if you want to go over this class again, uh, I'm posting the classes on face on uh, YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel because it will help you, especially next Sunday. We are going to have a lecture that is going to be on YouTube. It's not going to be on uh, on this platform here on Zoom. Uh, the lecture will be with Alvaro Mordecai, and he's going to talk about Moses and the two commandments. He's a, he's a, he was an Orthodox Jew that uh, became a spiritist uh, three, four years ago. So he brings all the uh, Jewish knowledge and the beginnings of the Jewish uh, religion to spiritism and combines it with spiritism. Is very is a very interesting uh, person to to listen to and to learn from. So next Sunday um, at 11 a.m. through our YouTube channel, we are going to have a lecture by Alvaro Mordecai, okay? You're all invited. Um, also, our regular meetings, 
on Tuesday at noon. On Thursday at noon, we have the Spiritist Group of Connecticut that is an associated with a Spiritist Group of New York that has the study of the gospel. It's also on our email. And then we have the 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, the Spirit's Book and Heaven and Hell. So uh, we, we thank you all for joining us. We thank you all for uh, participating. And uh, we are going to ask Carol to do our final prayer. Are you there, okay. Carol? Yes. Thanks. Infinite Creator, Great Spirit, those in the spirit world who are with us as well. We give thanks for the opportunity to be together today, to experience our studies, and to create a unification within our group, our country, our society. We are grateful for the spiritual benefactors, the good spirits, those who are abiding with us, assisting us, bringing us information, caring, kindness, and above all guidance, we are truly grateful. We give thanks for what we have learned today, for the exchange, for the knowledge that we may pursue in depth a greater understanding of sexuality, not only realizing in the current moment, but it reflects a state of 400,000 years. May we have a better understanding, a better kindness, and a better respect for one another when in doubt, may we refer to the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We remind ourselves that we are never alone. There is always guidance. There is always help as we do our part, but we must ask and we must do our part. May we continue with our prayers and with our studies and mindfulness throughout the week. May we be of service. May we be of greater awareness of our thoughts so that we can raise the vibration to a higher level. This will allow each of us to remain intact as well as relating to a greater community at large. We, we, as we close this meeting, we are grateful for those that who have participated, for the directors, for the guides, for the mentors of this, of this spirit, spiritist group. And as we close, may we remind ourselves to be beacons of light. May we go forth now in peace to our family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. So be it. Thanks, Carol. Thank You're you welcome. all for joining us. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Well, yes. Are we going to have the question and answer session? Oops. <laughs> Completely forgot about that, Julio. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> All right. For those that want to stay for a Q&A, yes, please stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank I, you. I put it on the I put it on the website, but I, you didn't say anything. I was I didn't know. Uh, well, I completely forgot that we had the uh, oh, okay. when they hit the post. Well, I'm, I'm going to be around. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It was, it was probably my fault. I apologize. I spoke too much. <laughs> no, 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 Fabio. Don't worry about it. Okay, so I can start with a follow-up question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, I love to ask questions. Um, okay, so... I think that we're all trying to um, learn how to, to, like I said, like how to avoid acting in our inferior tendencies and, and maybe I should use the word train ourselves to, to like Carol said in her prayer beautiful, beautifully, um, align ourselves with the higher vibrations um, and, and so avoid having a contact that's not, uh, uh, that, that could harm others, right? Um, in a general sense, what tools uh, could we be using, inspired in, in like any of the books to, to accomplish that?
Julio. Go. Okay. Self-evaluation, self-criticism. Now, I think these are the first steps because if you are, if you don't even address it to yourself, if we do not address it to ourselves, um, we don't even start the process. Now, I may be self-critical. I may go through self-analysis of my actions, but I may still block myself from acting on the results of those things if my pride is still too high, too intense. But it is the beginning. Because if I, even, if I don't even address it, Tell myself, hey, wait a second, look what you're saying or doing or even thinking. I would just go acting in a subconscious way, in an instinctive way, as we saw today. But as I mentioned in one of the conversations um, was, we also have eventually, I think was Renata's question, we also have to study. Because eventually, even if I do my best to be self-critical, even if I do my best to, sell, to, to, to be uh, analytical about my actions, my, my speech, my thoughts, eventually I can only analyze everything based on what I know. So if I know very little, I will be limited to that amount. So reading, discussing, participating allows me to learn from others and improving that knowledge base which will allow me to be even more self-critical and so on and so forth. Okay. For those who are here for the first time, um, every first Sunday of the month, after our, our regular study, we have a Q&A session, which is a, an open session for people that, to bring questions about spiritism and uh, yeah. any subject related to spiritism. So, um, and you know, my mistake, I, we should have uh, advertised, I completely forgot, because normally, you know, it's our, our regular meetings with, that we have, but uh, so that's why we're staying here, and uh, we are open to anyone that has any question, please feel free to um, ask your question. Well, can I just compliment something to what Alini said? Go ahead. Um, I... Every time that I have an opportunity to speak about this, I, I speak about this. At the end of the, um, the gospel, there's a bunch of uh, prayers. And there's one in particular, it's a couple of lines, essentially. It's essentially telling you before you go to bed that you should ask for high elevated spirits to come and help you and answer some of your questions or inspire you in, or direct you whatever you want them to do and by high elevated, high elevated spirits let's not forget it's just my um, sphere of influence so to speak are my relatives you know the loving and loved people that I met that I consider to be my first guides my the people that are going to be opening the doors in my opinion, are going to be relatives of mine that I that I met, that I've known, or that I've heard about it even, because I'm very interested in history. So of course, I know the whole history of my family, and that has helped me immensely too to understand where they were, why they took those actions, and if I were in fact a player in one of those actions because I'm talking about stuff that happened that I know of of 100 and 150 100 years ago. But anyway, so I start with that. Um, I think it's been very helpful for me um, to, before going to bed, as I said, to talk about this. And then in the morning, um, I don't know where I read about this. I don't know if it was in another book, but essentially I reminded myself, I ask again, I give thanks for the presence of them during my past night. I do this every night, every day. And I ask my guardian angel to remind me or inspire me to, be, to remember whatever it was that I heard that I was instructed to do or that they told me. Pretty much that's it. 
Thanks, Fabio. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Go ahead. Um, uh, just expanding a little bit on the uh, the sex part, because you know we still have um, uh, I'm not say cultures, but let's say people that nowadays they pretty much uh, see the sex as just a, a way of to procreate. They don't do you know, not much of that, and uh, since uh, you know, we are evolving. And as uh, primitive beings, we pretty much use the sex also for the same reason, just to procreate. So, um, and nowadays, you know, we use uh, sex, you know, for pleasure and, you know, all the things that the great stuff we do with sexuality. So, uh, so how do you see that, you know, how, um, I think the question is, Comparing to uses just as a way of to procreate in the way we use today, and since we are evolving, where where is that evolvement from what we used to do with sex from what we do today? Because uh, it seems that even though we are using more than a, an intellectual way, a way to express ourselves, it 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 at least on my perspective, it looks like uh, if we just use for procreation, we'll be better off than just using the way we are using sex nowadays. So just, you know, your thoughts on that. We, we cannot go against our nature. Um, so to, to restrict sex only to procreation at our level of evolution is going, is, is going against our nature. Um, I, we know that in the evolutionary process, as we are evolving, sex is to be used as an instrument of affectivity, of uh, love, of uh, intimacy between a couple, uh, between two spirits that love each other, that share their lives and their ideals. Uh, and that, as uh, in the evolutionary path that we are today um, is what we can understand from sexual relationship. Because if we try to um, repress ourselves, we are not acting as we are. We are acting on a desire to prevent ourselves from doing something that uh, we still want to do. And that's going to eventually come out in a different way, you know, because we everything that we repress eventually comes out. And how is it going to come out? It's going to be uh, very uh, dangerous. So, of course, nowadays, uh, the sexual liberation that we have seen in the last uh, 50 years, it has reached some extremes that are not healthy for, for the majority of us. But of course, we come from a completely repressive state to the other extreme, which is everything out in the air. And as usual, as always, balance is in the middle, right? So we have natural instincts, natural uh, necessities, and uh, the sexual activity is part of it. But learning and exercising our right to use it in a productive way is the challenge for each one of us. Learning to use it for relationships, to enhance our relationships, to inspire our togetherness with whoever we are. And again, uh, we are not going to go into the, uh, the, in the exclusivity because these are all, if we, you are together with someone and you have the same goals, the same ideals, same objectives, of course you are fulfilling yourself and you try, you are going to try to 
build your life around these um, necessities and these individuals. But, uh, but again, Renato, um, every time we look at excesses on either side, it's going to cause problems. And uh, you see this, what celibacy has done to the Catholic Church, right? All the problems that they are having, because you cannot impose these things. Everything has to be natural and it has to be on a natural evolutionary process that we're still struggling to, to learn and understand, but that's what we should try to do. Okay, anyone else? Julie? I, I have a question. In sure. that specific text, that, going back to, to, to the book, it refers to, open quote, those who carelessly fling themselves into reckless adventures of animalized sentiment. Then the following paragraph refers to uh, contribution to medical science and treatments, so forth. Uh, for instance, endocrinology can do much with hormone injections as first aid. How, uh, my question is, where is the reference to the victim of that person who ventured himself or herself into reckless you know, animalized sentiment because they're always the victim. And I did not see a reference to the victim. I could not observe that. Where is the reference to the victim of the people who engage in reckless animalized sentiment? To, just to phrase what is in the text. Thank you. So Maria, uh, the question is valid but the, this chapter is about uh, two things. One, to make a distinction of sexual conduct, and the other is the sexual act. So in some cases, we refer to it as a sexual act. Some cases we are addressing the sexual conduct, which is much more broader. It's, it's much broader, I'm sorry. Um, sexual act is part of the sexual conduct but not everything not but it's not the only thing that we have in sexual conduct which is what Juan was addressing when Renato asked the question tenderness for instance is a form of, of behavior of conduct and is not necessarily the sexual act so this chapter is to create awareness awareness for our own actions and this is why perhaps there's no this is perhaps why there is no reference to victims because the idea here is as the 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 lecturer in the spiritual realm was saying was not to pass judgment but address problems each one of us bring with us you know and um, it it doesn't mean it's not concerned with victims is not minimizing the pain the victims go through right but if we address that side as well the chapter explodes in size because then there's a lot of other things that we have to take into consideration so when we read this chapter i think it's important that we see it from the point of view of when i read it what i can do to improve myself of course my actions since we are speaking of sexual conduct definitely will have an impact on someone else someone else or depending on my promiscuity even on many others but right now i am the one who should be looking at myself i am the one should be who should be more self-critical who should uh, perform more of a self-analysis to see what I can improve and in doing so, consequently minimize impact of negative actions I may have, my negative conduct towards others. Okay, um, I believe Ruth has a couple of questions. Ruth? Yes, no? Yeah, I got a question. Okay, go ahead, Hanat. It's more of a follow-up question. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, still on the uh, sexual topic. Uh, we, we, you know, we have the uh, we had uh, the, the the incident with uh, John of God, and uh, much was said regarding the uh, sexual energy and mediumship and healing and blah blah blah. And uh, of course, you know, uh, we study in spiritists that you know we we don't have to focus on the energy, but the application of the, the energy. But uh, since we are you know, studying the topic of sex, and uh, as a spiritist, we also study mediumship. Uh, can you, any of you, expand a little bit more since we had that problem uh, with uh, uh, sexuality and energy and mediumship and the application uh, of it? Um, okay, so for those that uh, are not aware of uh of how mediumship of physical phenomena works. Um, mediumship of physical phenomena is the mediumship where you act on the, uh, on the physical uh, side. So apparitions, materializations, noises, uh, uh, physical surgeries done through mediums, through spirits. These are all physical phenomena. Uh, um, you know, paintings, uh, the, the, how do you call the paintings? The, the paintings that appear by themselves without any anyone involved. Uh, the, I forgot the name. The ones that are in Lilydale there, they are beautiful, the, the paintings. There. Anyways, so all these, for the mediums of, of physical phenomena, they, they need to, in order to replenish their energies normally, they need physical uh, things and uh, they need food, they need drinks and could be alcoholic drinks. And they, well, it's not that they need, let me rephrase that. They replenish their energies by using um, food, drinks, even sex. Now, Shiko was a medium of physical phenomena, he was able to do materializations and that. And you never heard of Shiko doing anything like that. Because something that we read in this chapter, what we call sublimation, you, subli you sublimate your mediumship uh, with the, the use of your energies to a, to a higher purpose. A medium like John of God, what happened to him, he's a medium of physical effects. He did, he did uh, physical surgeries. And, uh, you know, he was using sex as an, a tool to replenish his energies. And, of course, this, it was a deviation of, uh, of how he used his energies. And he was taking advantage, abusing people. So do, do all mediums of physical phenomena need to replenish through this uh, inferior uh, acts? No and Chico Xavier is the example. But one of the most famous mediums of the, of the beginning of, of the spiritu spiritualism and spiritism uh, called Eusapia Palladino, an Italian, she, she suffered so much from her mediumship because she was prodded and tested and abused by the, 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 the researchers that uh, one, one one side, she, uh, in the end, she faked a lot of her mediumship. And on the other side, it caused her to become nymphomaniac, uh, to become a uh, food addict, alco alcoholic. So it's very complicated, the, the, the mediumship of physical phenomena. If this, the, the spirit is not able to control himself or herself, it can cause a lot of damage. But it can be controlled. It can sub be sublimated, uh, and we have Chico there to prove it, that, uh, you know, it is possible. And again, it's not that Chico is a, uh, oh, I cannot compare myself to Chico. Well, we have to try. He, if he could, we can. Um, I don't know if you have something, Julio, to add. No, I think you covered. I mean, uh, mediumship is not something that is 
that that appears in individuals that are already morally and intellectually developed. It is a tool that some of us use to reach a better moral and intellectual development. In saying that, it means that if now I have this particular type of mediumship of, of uh, physical phenomena, it will depend on my moral intellectual level to guide me, I will depend on it to guide me where I'm going to find the energy to replenish myself. So then if you have a medium like Francisco Xavier, who was more morally and intellectually quite advanced in comparison to, to the average, you see a person sublimating this form, sublimating himself. And then in other cases, you see that individuals like Giuseppe Palladino, uh, for instance, who ended up um, looking for that energy in, perhaps in the wrong ways or not wrong, but we, ha we have to understand that the individual is with a deficit of energy. The individual is now in pursuit of that energy. And then it's just that the individual is not making the most constructive choices where to find it. And if now the, ch the choices are not very constructive and the individual on top of, of it adds pride, the fall is imminent. João, Julio, I have a question. Uh, this is Anna. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying that the mediums that work with physical phenomena, um, they need to uh, replenish their energy in some way, um, what would be the appropriate way to replenish this energy? You know, what are some of the constructive ways of doing that? I, I'm not sure I really understood what Juan just explained that. Eating, eating healthy. It's the, the easiest answer is eating healthy. You need to replenish your energies. You can replenish them through food. And uh, there is a healthy food that uh, will help you replenish what you need. Uh, what the problem is that as these mediums, they, they end up you, uh, trying to replenish in other forms, you know, alcohol or sex, which are also ways of replenishing this energy. And, uh, but the simpler way, and those that know Chico, uh, there is a, you know, there are always stories of Chico and how he, he liked to eat and he ate very well. Um, always respecting others and respecting the animals. He would talk to, to the food, he would talk to the, the ants, he would talk to anyone, and that, any animals. But, uh, but I'm sure that uh, you can replenish through spiritual energies also, that I'm sure someone like Chico could do. But uh, if we are not Chico and uh, we, we are lacking these energies, healthy food is, there's plenty of, of healthy to food to replenish us. I have a question. Sure, Ruth. Um, actually, my husband has a question. Okay. I, I, I read the gospel every day, and sometimes I read it out loud uh, to my wife and my daughter's present in the room. Um, I, I vibrate quite often, and especially when I say Jesus' name uh, as I'm reading the gospel. And I'm curious of why I vibrate, why is it my spirit? Is it another spirit? Um, that's really my question. Okay, so when you are elevating your thoughts through the prayers and uh, by, by really what you are doing is you really mean what you are saying and what you are thinking, you connect yourself to elevated spirits that are around us always, that are around you and are are communing with you on your prayer. And uh, people that are more sensitive or are sensitive can feel something, can feel this energy coming from the superior spirits, which is uh, a pleasant type of energy that you are going to feel, a pleasant sensation of, of, of uh of togetherness, of belonging, or something like that. Each person is different, of course. But um, every time we are 
sincerely praying and we are elevating our thoughts, we are connecting ourselves to elevated spirits and uh, we may feel that. Some people feel better, more, some people feel less, some people feel none. But uh, I believe in your case, you, you, these connections, you are feeling them in some form. Was it clear? Yes, thank you. Another question is, um, when you feel something on top of your head, it's almost like, like right now, it feels like something is right on top, at least for me, it's really on top of my head, like um, almost like pins and needles. And at the same time, it goes into rounding and rounding. It's a very, it's almost like a, it's that energy that is, almost like a tornado in a way um, or flashing and uh, is there any connection to because we are here talking about spiritism or um, can um, you say something I, about yeah, I'm, it's difficult to say Ruth because it's difficult to 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 know exactly what you are the one feeling. So it's difficult for us to understand exactly what it is. But I think the same answer I gave you, I gave to your husband, the connections that you are making, um, it's, it's, it's what, uh, it's what you are feeling there in some form. But I, I don't know, Julio, you have something else to add there? Yes. So, um, Look, I, I, I exactly as Ron said, I cannot comment on your case, Ruth, in particular. I, I just want to make a, a general comment, all right? Um, so uh, please work with me here. It's, a, it's really general. We should always go back to the basics and should always look at physical um, explanations before we go into the spiritual ones. It's nice to think that it's a mentor next to us or that we are being blessed and great. And I would not in any form say that that's wrong. No, but there is also another thing. When we are very, very into something, when we are very focused, we tend to squint our eyes. That will produce a form of headache a form of, of uh, needle pricks that we would probably address like that, simply because we are squinting or we are squishing our eyes. And that's basically just physical. It, no one is going to be blind because of that, but, but it's part of this intense medita meditative state that we go into or this, um, this willingness to be a part of that process. So there's nothing wrong with it but it's more of a physical explanation before we may even begin, before we begin considering something else. But one thing we should always be sure is that um, if it is something that is spiritual, it's always some, going to be something positive because of what we are doing. We are focusing our minds. We have the best thoughts possible. Therefore, we are, uh, we are attracting to ourselves the mentors, the or the, those even if they are not mentors, but spirits that are like us, that think alike, and that want the best for us. Yeah, just adding is uh, it's not necessarily physical. It's almost like I feel that it's a little bit above, uh, on like the crown, like like uh, the crown chakra. It's almost like. Um, it's not, I don't feel, it, I feel like it's almost like a both. It's not the physical part of it. So that's why I, I yeah. thought there was- Even there, there, even that, I would, um, again, general, like Ron said very well, I cannot comment on your case. Even that we have, our, our nervous system is very tricky when it comes to sensations. There is something called referred pain when you actually feel pain on one side of your body and actually the place that is aching or has a biochemical issue is on the other side or below or above it. 
So we have to be very careful with all these things. This is why it's difficult for me or for João or anyone else to give you a, a definite answer to add your case or anyone else's for that matter. But yes, I like to say something. I do, um, the way that I dealt with in the past is exactly through exercise and yoga and swimming, a lot of swimming. Um, and I also, I'm blessed that I have, I'm able to play the piano. So the piano that I play is also very, um, there's a lot of things going on there. Um, it's just ways that I have found to express this uh, whenever I had felt the need to, you know, it's, it's a weird sensation to have the physical aspect. And, um, but you, as, as everybody has been saying, you just have to know yourself and your capabilities and, where do you want to where do you want to go from there you want to start from <clears throat> from ground zero and you know ground zero is always that makes you happy and loved so so it's a great start in my opinion thank you again thank you thanks fabio um another question is um could a spirit appear on a photo like an as a reflection of a window or something uh, there are some pictures that um, um, that we've seen uh, out there that uh, appears to have a spirit somewhere. Um, I would I would leave that as a maybe because I don't I don't really feel comfortable saying yes or no here. There's I, a famous I, I, one of Carlos Gomez, right? Is that the one that everybody remembers? There's one of the composer Carlos Gomez in the window in a, in a photograph. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever seen this, but this is the one that I remember that I probably is a reference to what we were just talking about. Yeah, there was a big, a big uh, 10 years ago in the Metropolitan Museum, there is a, a big exposition of a, of a mediumship uh, uh, photography and uh, a lot of pictures there. Um, a lot of them unexplained and a lot of them fake, uh, saying that they were fake. So, um, you know, I'm, again, I, I think it's possible, but I, I, and I think it's likely, but I don't want to say it's, it's, uh, it happens for sure. Julio, go ahead. Um, just so that we um, shake hands with Kardec again, because for a moment there we let our hands go. The spirit, no, you will not see a spirit on any, in any photograph. But I understand what Ruth was asking. What you will see is a physical manifestation of that spirit, because the spirit itself is not physical. And if we are using a photograph, which is physical, it must be a physical manifestation for it to be recorded. Yeah. This is important for us. I mean, I understood Ruth's question, but since we are discussing, we are learning, we have, we, we let us not, for, not, let us not miss this opportunity to address these tiny little things because they are important. So the spirit itself at that moment, when the photograph is taken, again, I'm taking, I'm assuming here that, it is possible and that it could be measured. At that moment, the photograph is taken. There is a very brief manifestation of that spirit physically. And this is why it's captured. And how, how that manifestation can take place is just with a, with a, me, a medium around it would be enough to manifest for that to happen? You would need a medium of physical phenomena, physical effects around. It doesn't have to be right next to the ones being photographed. It can be in the other room, but there will have to be a medium nearby of, um, of uh, physical effects, of physical phenomena yeah. to produce a link to the spiritual realm for that manifestation to happen. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit how that happens? Is that with the fluids that the medium has that it would... The ectoplasm. Yes. Uh, but the details we do not know, Root. Unfortunately, all we, all we can say to you is that it's a form of energy here from the physical realm, as Ron was saying, the ectoplasm, that is going to take the form 
being guided by that mediumship will take the form, but how it happens in detail or the order of events, we do not know. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so someone asked me in the chat and I'm going to raise the question here, uh, Julio, um, that, uh, and uh, I know, I'm, I'm not sure if Elmo can speak. I, I think it would be more in Elmo's world, but uh, anyway, I'm going to raise here. So how can we explain uh, PMS in the spiritist view? Meaning women have hormonal cycles, but the, the behavior, uh, it's always more always spiritual. So uh, how can we relate the PMS with the, 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 the behavior of, of the, the women in that period? Mm. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, Elmo, you want to say anything? I have no clue. <laughs> Absolutely okay. no clue. If anybody okay. has seen any spiritual li literature, please let me know. Um, In this case, I think it's horror now. <laughs> no? Well, but you know, uh, you 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 have to always understand that there is a combination of the. Uh, we are a spirit inhabiting a physical body, right? So our physical body will have reactions uh, that are natural to the physical body. How we react to them, we as spirits, depends on our moral and intellectual evolution. So, let's say, um, someone. Uh, a woman killing someone and blaming on uh, PMS, it's not, uh, it, you know, it's in the end, if you kill someone, it's because it's there. It's, uh, it's in the, uh, like Julius was saying this in the study, it's the, the, in the subconscious, right? You just used uh, a, a state of a physical, um, physical feelings to act on something that uh, is already there. So it's the same thing uh, when, uh, when you, you enter into a fight, right? Or you are going to act on, uh, on your instincts, but the instincts is you. In the end, it's you. So I think the PMS may be just a trigger that uh, will uh, express some things that may be hidden in the subconscious or something like that. But again, like Elmo said, there is no literature for that. And it's just us trying to understand how the physical body and the spirit combines to react on, uh, on things, right? So when a spirit is mentally challenged, when a physical body is mentally challenged, the spirit cannot act on it. Even the spirit is not mentally challenged. It's just the physical body. So the physical body imposes limitations and imposes restrictions that uh, prevents the spirit to act on it or provokes reactions that may cause the spirit to act on it depending on who we are. So uh, again, it goes back to the simple example that uh, we use all the time of patients, right? Uh, if someone is testing your patients, if you don't have it, you eventually are going to, as we say, lose your patience. But if you have patience, it's part of you. You can try as much as you can that um, you're not going to lose your patience. Uh, if you are not, if you don't drink, you never drank, and you are not an alcoholic or never were, you can go inside a bar, everybody's drinking, and you are not dr going to drink, and you're not going to feel anything, any need to drink or anything. You may feel uh, uneasiness if you have spiritual uh, sensitivity to the ambient because the ambient is heavy. So it can, um, it can uh, affect you in that sense, but it's not going to make you drink because that's not you. And I think it's the same thing, right? In the end, uh, I... I uh, yeah, in, the, in the absence of specific literature, as Elmo pointed out, it's difficult for, for us to address the question directly. Indirectly, on the other hand, we can say exactly what you was saying, remind, remembering that the triggers of the physical life expose what is still in development in each and every one of us. So whenever we are exposed to something that is going to trigger impatience, 
if we have not, as John was saying, if we have not dominated patients to such an extent that it's now second nature to us, we are going to react to it, most likely. The more we butylate ourselves, the more we improve ourselves, the less likely we are to react to these triggers of the physical life. And this is not for patients, it's for everything. So in principle, we could answer this question indirectly, but I, I want to emphasize it's an indirect way. We can extend this thought to this particular scenario, but remember, this is not a direct uh, form of addressing the question. So I, I have think, got... sorry, what's missing here maybe is that not just women have these things in their subconscious, men do too. The thing that we have that men don't have is hormone, hormonal imbalance that may, will help us bring it to the surface and maybe help us deal with it trigger. better or more efficiently than guys because they don't have that, but we do. So maybe in a way we can see it as an advantage because we, we can actually look at ourselves more like once a month and see, wow, this was actually hit in my subconscious and it's coming up with my hormones and yeah. I can try to fix it. Yeah, it, it can be a tool to, to self-knowledge, absolutely. Definitely. I commend your constructive approach. <laughs> no, it, no, it, uh, if, if we see it- 44 way, years of having to deal with this. So we got to find a silver lining. <laughs> but, but you did find it. You, you put the effort to find it. That's the point. That's why I say I commend the constructive approach. Yeah. I found that uh, with spiritists um, studying it, it's much easier to deal with a lot of like having more patience and being more charitable. And I believe that um, spiritism really brought a lot to our lives that we didn't have as much as we do now. Yes, um, the information that Spiritism brings us is invaluable, but um, the use we make of it is our own personal journey, right? I got a question. Um, more, more, I'm curious about something. Since uh, Juan said, uh, uh, back on the sex topic that not just to use the sex as a procreation at our levels, you know, we're not doing ourselves a favor. And uh, I believe that sex is not something uh, essential for us, for our survival, like eating, because, you know, if we don't eat, we die. If we don't do sex, if we don't have sex, we're not going to die. We're probably going to go nuts, but we're not going to die. <clears throat> But uh, when you go to the spiritual realm, spiritual, you know, spiritual side, you still have to eat. You know, we, you know, we read books that, you know, we have soup or whatever, something in order for the spirit to understand the transition. We don't need to eat, but there's, you know, spiritual food, whatever you call it. So, uh, so when, when, you know, since, you know, we study, we see uh, spirits there are so attached to sex when they got to the other side but let's not go to the extreme let's say to a regular person you know normal um, on the spirit level uh, probably will have the same impulse to sex as eating as well but uh, you won't be able to fulfill that impulse the spirit won't be able to fulfill that impulse once you're in the spirit realm because you don't have the physical body so uh, how does one uh, address that impulse, that energy, or how does one deal with that once, you know, is in the spiritual side of it? Um, we, you have to understand, uh, we have to separate here. Sex um, is a natural instinct of the physical body, is a necessity of the physical body that, of course, the spirit carries with it. So once we go back to the spiritual world where the physical uh, body is no longer available, so the physical activity of sex is no longer available, 
as we are, if we are a spirit that is evolved enough to understand, to accept, and to deal with it, we won't feel the need for it that we have in the physical body. But the the ultimate uh, connection that we have with each other, which goes way beyond sex, will continue. So the relationships will continue and the so-called sexual necessity, uh, between quotes, will be fulfilled by spiritual uplifting connections. The same way that uh, we don't eat to we don't need to eat in the spiritual world, but until we understand that, we may need uh, the soups or whatever uh, Andre Luis tells that uh, we, we have in the spiritual world. But once you understand that, that you don't need, that you can feed yourself with the spiritual energies, that, that is enough, then we will no longer need to eat. Um, it's the same thing with sex, uh, and I'm not talking again. I'm not talking about those that are addicted, because those are the ones that, when they go back to the spiritual world, they are going to attach themselves to those that are doing these acts here on earth. But um, as we go back to the spiritual world on our, our evolutionary process, we shouldn't feel the need of uh, the physical necessity of sex because we no longer have a physical body. Julio, anything to add there? Um, yes, I would like to compliment uh, by... Uh, um, let us look at the worst possible scenario when, uh, as John was saying, we were so addicted to it or we are so basal in our instinctive behavior that we move back to the spirituality. For these individuals, the spiritual body is as real as the physical one was. They are gonna go through orgies. They are gonna go through a lot of things, actions, sexual acts there that will for them be as real as they used to be here in the physical plane. But this is the extreme. Then you're going to see another category of spirits who are still very attached to material things, but already a little more uh, evolved or let's say less uh, ignorant than the previous ones. And these are the ones that are going to associate themselves to those of us here reincarnated and they will live through us. They will live vicariously through our actions perhaps even incite us to go and, pro and promote more sexual activity so that they can benefit more or more often, okay? But then for this middle ground that we are talking about, let us remember that the, uh, as we go through the centers of energy and we go from the coronal all the way down to the genesic one or the basal one, the, right? Remember that the center of energy, the genetic center of energy that is responsible for sexual activity in the physical realm is also responsible for an artistic side. It's also responsible for everything that can sublimate ourselves in the form of art and the same music and in the, in the, in the sexual field. When we go back to the spiritual realm, we no longer have the physical body, as Ron was saying. So for the average individuals, that center of energy is still there because we still retain somewhat our shape with our spiritual body. But then we are going to use that genetic center of energy for other things. We don't longer need to use it or develop it through the sexual act but that center of energy will still be important and will manifest it in other things, more artistic things. So it's there as a center of energy in our spiritual body because the spiritual body keeps a record. It's actually the blueprint for the physical body. But the way we manifest or express is not necessarily identical to the way we express and manifest it 
here in the physicality, in the physical plane. So there, there are ways of sublimating the sense of sublimation here is not repression and it's not uh, tossing it out. Sublimation here is in the sense of promoting something constructive. The, the genesic center of energy will be used in other expressions, in other manifestations, artistic ones, for instance. Okay. All right. Cool. Guys, 1.30. So we did our Q&A and uh, we, we study enough today. Thank you all for staying with us, all those that stayed. And um, any volunteer to do our final prayer? Alina? Why don't I do it? I'm so grateful to be with you guys again. So. Go ahead. Master Jesus, dear sp spiritual benefactors that were with us today, we come in gratitude for our directors, our colleagues, our friends, and the opportunity to be together here in these challenging circumstances that we're living these days, to focus on the studies and understanding and growth that the spiritual doctrine brings to us and supporting each other in this process. Thank you for your assistance. Please continue to guide us and inspire us as we go through our week and that we may meet again next Sunday. So be it. Thanks.